It was 50 years ago, in the fabled summer of 69, where one man's small step profoundly changed mankind forever. Hi, this is Sam Lubman, producer of the Mark Guzman Podcast Experience, and this is a special episode dedicated to the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing on the moon. In the 50 years since the Apollo 11 landing, we may have only returned five times, but since that day... The accomplishment of putting a man on the moon has become the benchmark for human innovation and success. What do you mean it's impossible? We put a man on the moon, we say to justify our drive for something more. Obviously, Mark and I were not around 50 years ago when this amazing moment of human accomplishment occurred. We can only relive that day the stories told to us by those who were there. Well, and the internet. Today, we present to you the stories of several individuals in the recollection of July 20th, 1969. Some of these names you might know, others you may not. But what these individuals have in common is that for one moment, they and the rest of the world stood transfixed by one moment, by one giant leap for mankind. Frank Munich has lived in the Bay Area his entire life. A long-time reporting and radio veteran, Frank today can be heard doing traffic for KCBS Radio. Frank recalls celebrating his sixth birthday the day of the moon landing. Uh, Well, I was uh, six years old. I just turned six years old at the time. I'd been taken by my parents to a sixth birthday dinner at the Cliff House in San Francisco. Uh, And I remember just before the moon landing happened, being taken by my father into a small, uh, at that time, very smoky bar in the Cliff House and being hoisted on the shoulders of my father. Place was absolutely packed. Uh, Everybody, every man was, uh, you know, wearing a suit and every woman was wearing a dress at the time. And I remember peering down at the small black and white TV set with antenna, with an antenna, rabbit ears, and watching the exact moment that the men landed on the moon. Uh, And I, I, children have a way of kind of knowing when something is important or when adults, you know, think something is important. And that's one of my few memories from, you know, that, that time of my life. Uh, and there was an interesting side note, too. Um, my mother was the only person who did not leave the dining room and go into the bar to watch the moon landing. And I remember after the moon landing had happened, sort of walking back into the dining room and seeing this massive dining room with completely deserted. Nobody in it except for my mother still eating at the very far end of the dining room. And she later explained that she didn't leave the dining room to go see the moon landing because she had had one of the best lobster thermidors she had ever had in her entire life. And she said that she was convinced that she would be able to see, you know, highlights of the moon landing ad nauseum for years to come, but she'd never have a lobster thermidor that good again. And she was afraid that the wait staff would come and take it away. And I have to admit, you know, as as a journalist for most of my life, initially, you know, I've disagreed with that for most of my life as a journalist because, you know, I mean, I I like to, you know, witness news and and see news happening. But I have to admit, the older and older I get, the more and more I agree with her. I mean, she got the opportunity to see the moon landing over and over and over again, and she got to eat her lobster thermidor and, and have it too. I mean, she was able to eat, you know, eat her cake and have it too. So uh, that's what I remember from the, from the moon landing. Ben Burris is among the lead astronomers at the Chabot Space and Science Center. A two-time guest on this podcast, Ben recalls how the Apollo 11 and Apollo 13 missions played a role in inspiring his career in astronomy. I have to cast my memory all the way back to when I was seven years old. I remember bits and pieces of the actual, you know, sitting in front of the television, watching uh, watching the moon landing, especially Apollo 11. 
um, I was up at a summer camp um, that mom was a cook at, and uh, I'd spend the whole summer up there, so we just happened to be there on July 20th. Uh, there was only one television within a mile, I think, uh, so we all crowded into the caretaker couple's cabin and uh, huddled around their little black and white TV <laughs> um, and watched the moon landing. I remember very, very clearly sitting there and after the lunar lander had landed, um, I was kind of impatient being a seven-year-old. Uh, it took the astronauts a long time to actually get out of the thing and come down and step on the moon, which is, of course, what I was, what I was waiting for. And I said, what's taking them so long? Something like that. I remember my dad saying, oh, they're probably on there playing poker or something. So <laughs> that was his... Uh, that was his... Um, his uh, response to that. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's funny being a seven year old at the time, the things I remember more vividly are the toys I had, uh, all of those Ap Apollo era toys, like the, uh, the Mercury capsule GI Joe space, you know, astronaut uh, toy, which I loved a uh, little, uh, coin bank. That was a rocket. You put the coins in there and use a little spring load to shoot the coins inside the bank. Uh, and other paraphernalia, I just remember more vividly the, the toys I played with that were connected to the, the space program. Um, but I do remember the, the snippets here and there of watching you know, TV and watching the national, international coverage. Um, so, yeah, that was Apollo 11. Um, I do have a, a story to tell about Apollo 13, if you have a moment. Okay, <laughs> this is more memorable because it, it uh, struck an emotional chord. Um, I remember especially falling in love with the look of the lunar lander, so the lunar module. I just thought it was the coolest looking spaceship. You know, it had these four legs with landing pads. It had all sorts of gadgets sticking out of it, little retro rockets, and, you know, it just looked really cool. It looked like, unlike anything I'd seen, you know, rockets and sleek looking uh, capsules and things and there were during the apollo 13 um problem when the, you know they had the onboard accident and they couldn't land and there were you know several times where they were in danger of not making it back to earth i remember there was a newspaper headline that was titled the ugly spindly legged aquarius aquarius the name of the lunar uh, module for apollo 13 so basically the story was about how this spaceship saved their lives as a lifeboat. But I was outraged. You know, as this eight-year-old who loved the lunar lander, I was absolutely outraged. So I wrote a letter to NASA defending the honor of the, <laughs> the lunar lander. <laughs> and for my trouble, I got an autographed copy of the uh, signed by the three astronauts back, which I cherish to this day. But uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh, I was just watching Antiques Roadshow, and somebody had exactly the same picture, and uh, the the appraiser was telling him that you know, these various pictures are worth, you know, this one's worth a thousand dollars, you know, if it's originally signed and all that. So I might actually have a valuable piece of space paraphernalia there. <laughs> Today, Kirk Weir lives in Folsom, California. A former service member who was a part of Operation Desert Shield, Kirk recalls a weekend trip to his grandmother's to watch the moon landing. Yeah, so that summer, um, my grandmother rented a beach house in an area called Irish Beach, which is probably an hour south of Mendocino on the coast. And the, the house had a, a black and white TV, which most people only had black and white back in the late 60s. And um, it happened to be my brother's birthday, which is why I always remember July 20th. And I, and I just remember being a little kid at that time, you know, America was, was still in love and in awe of the space program. And to be able to actually, you know, carry the landing, you know, essentially live on TV and watch, uh, and watch Neil Armstrong climbing out and, and that kind of thing, uh, was, it was, it was great. I mean, it was just fascinating to watch. I think, I think in the years since, Space travel has become, you know, so much more routine that it's not a big deal anymore. But back then, it was really a big deal. David Schwab today is a broker for Compass Real Estate here in the Bay Area. But 50 years ago, he was just a wide-eyed 18-year-old kid 
transfixed on a small black and white TV, just like everyone else. Um, geez, I, I mean, I think, as I recall, um, I was 18 years old, and um, I, I was at work, and there was a TV on, and we watched it. I mean, everything just kind of stopped. Um, other than that, I'm not quite sure what else. It was definitely exciting uh, and, and amazing to see somebody walking on the moon. Um, but to be honest with you, I don't remember much more than that. Kim Vestal has been a native of the South Bay for 40 years and is another well-known voice on Bay Area airwaves. Kim recalls writing in her diary the events of the Apollo 11 landing. All right. It was the summer of 69, obviously. I was 10 years old, and I was spending a couple of weeks at my grandparents' house uh, outside of San Diego. And all they had was a little small black and white television set, and they didn't spend a lot of time watching TV and the radio. And the radio and the TV were on 24-7 during the days leading up to the moon landing. And uh, since I was only 10 years old, you know, I wasn't exactly riveted, but I was very aware that something huge was happening. And then every night I'd go out on the deck and we'd look up to the stars. And my, I remember my grandfather telling me that there were, there were, you know, that the men would be walking on the moon and we would look up at the moon and it looked just the same. Uh, the little black and white television, the images were fuzzy and uh, everybody talked about it in the grocery store, uh, running errands, wherever we went, it was the talk of the town. So uh, I wrote it down in my diary, which I still have to this day. And I'm glad I did because um, we were all thinking it would become a regular thing. We thought we'd end up flying to the moon regularly, visiting the moon, and that obviously never happened. So it was a moment. Last September, Captain Mike McCarran came on the podcast and told Mark the story of how the USS Hornet, now docked in Alameda, was responsible for recovering the Apollo 11 crew on their return trip from the moon. And I didn't know about the uh, how he was involved with the space program right. with, uh, with the yeah, in two the, missions. In the Apollo, is you said Apollo 11 and 12? 11 and 12, the first two uh, manned missions uh, to the moon. Um, there were other carriers were involved in Vietnam, and this carrier was free um, to be used, and it was in the right place at the right time. And so they had crews recover the, the, the capsule and, the, crew, and the, the astronauts themselves. So that was July... And I think October or November of '69, and um, so those those are unique positions, and it is a unique, as I said, uniquely tied to the Apollo program and the space program, and we're really looking forward to that 50th anniversary next year and celebrating that. Um, we're hoping to get some astronauts here to celebrate. Uh, it's kind of dicey right now because they're probably be in Washington D.C. or at the Smithsonian, yeah. someplace like that. But we're trying to get some folks here. Um, it's going to be interesting the new space force that they're developing. Uh, yeah, it kind of remains to see how that's going to work out. Um, there's still some questions whether that's actually going to happen because it still has to be funded and what the mission is going to be. But um, And there's some treaties also that uh, kind of prevent you can, from militarizing space. So that's another issue that's got to be determined. Oh, there's treaties that prevent right. that? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's going to be – okay, yeah. So it's going to be very there's interesting to There's a lot, of, things to work, there are a lot of details to work out before that becomes a reality. Yeah, because I know um, NASA announced it along with uh, SpaceX – along with the uh, European Space Agency, that they all want to send a small little colony up to Mars. Right. That's, a, that's the next big push, is to, is to get people to Mars. And in fact, there's a spaceship being built right now called the Orion, um, which I love the name because that's the name of the plane I used to fly, but it's now going to be a spaceship. And it's, it's going to replace what the Apollo program was with the capsule. And uh, it's for long-range uh, interplanetary space travel. And they're doing testing on it right now. They've done some ballistic work on it as far as launching it and recovering it. And that uh, that will be the new manned space travel program. Uh, and hopefully it will go to Mars uh, sometime in the 
early 2020, 2024, somewhere around there or something like that. And they That's going to be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and that's a long trip. That's, you know, six eight, months, right? Yeah. Minimum that's, six months. And that's six months because what? of when the plan is line. That's one way. Then you got to run, come back. Yeah. So, yeah, I read somewhere where it's every two years yeah. you can travel back and forth right. and it's a six month travel. Right. Yeah. Thank you to everyone for listening to this podcast episode. Be sure to catch out our other audio episodes on iTunes, iHeart, and Spotify. And be sure to check out our video content on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram TV. And thank you especially to all of our guests for providing us with their stories of the moon landing. And as always, be sure to give a like and subscribe if you check out one of our pages and leave a comment to let us know what you think of the show.